Welcome. You're listening to Living Faith Podcast. Starry sky, see your hand in time, in mind to lead me through the night. Grateful for a lot of things. I'm grateful that Easter is still on the calendar in the United States of America. I, I appreciate that. Regardless of individual awareness or conviction, Easter is still noted every spring on the U.S. calendar. Even as Christianity isn't appreciated in our country as it once was, there remains many who value this important day. In our area alone, if you're aware, you know, Surveys suggest that for every one practicing Christian in this area, there are three who profess no faith whatsoever. Still, Easter is on our calendar. It's there reminding everyone of Jesus Christ, reminding everyone of his death, burial, and resurrection, reminding all of the cross of Jesus Christ. In recent weeks, this congregation, perhaps you noticed a banner outside the building or you've seen one of our promotional videos or you were given a card, but we've been in a series about the cross. We tried to investigate what the cross implies. Is it important? Does it have meaning other than on this weekend once a year? We've talked about a variety of aspects of that encounter. If you're interested in any of those topics, you can visit livingfaithministries.church, click on the media tab, and it'll direct you to videos or podcasts. What about today? Christianity is a centuries-old belief system. Many people are aware of Christianity, of Jesus and the cross. They might be unaware of details. Some people, let's just recognize it, some people think they know more than they do, aren't they? We make assumptions about stuff. Many know about his death on the cross. Many about his resurrection on the third day. But my my question this morning is why? why? What's the purpose of these events? Again, many people, even those who don't practice Christianity, they know that Jesus died to forgive human sin, our errors, our faults. Because of Christ, folks know we can ask for and receive forgiveness for our errors and our faults and be forgiven forever and for always. Many are aware. Because of Christ, we can be baptized in the name of Jesus and have our our sinful record completely wiped clean. When we apply the blood of Christ to our lives, His sacrifice cleanses our faults in the sight of the Lord completely. In His eyes, we become as white as snow. Amazing, miraculous, because of the cross. Many understand that because of Christ's resurrection on the third day, humans can receive the Holy Spirit, the power of God within us, power to overcome sinfulness, power to become all that he's designed us to be. Even so, I question, what is it that Jesus really wants from us? Forgiven, cleansed, empowered, awesome. For what? What's written, if you will, in the fine print of Jesus' offer? Hmm. How about we look to the words of Jesus and let him describe? Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 21, the scripture says this. Jesus warned his disciples not to tell anyone who he was. The Son of Man must suffer many terrible things, he said, 
He will be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He will be killed, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. Jesus foretold what we're celebrating even today. And then he went on, not just talking to his disciples. In the next verse, in verse 23, then he said to the crowd, to everyone who would hear, to anyone who would read this someday, to the crowd, if any of you, it's open to all, if any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost or destroyed? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. I love verse 27. I tell you the truth. Some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God. And so I wonder, what does Jesus want from us? It's simple, but not necessarily easy. He wants us to follow him. To follow him. That's the end game. That's the end play. That's the fine print. Follow Jesus. Now maybe as I ask more questions, you'll become a little irritated with my persistent questions. But what, what does Jesus mean by following? I mean, does he mean to follow him like I follow college basketball or the Mariners? Does he mean to follow him like I follow the stock market? Does following Jesus mean I'll follow him like I, I follow a vegetarian diet or a daily exercise plan? What does he mean when he says follow me? Maybe does he mean something akin to a, I'm a follower of the Green Party or the writings of Alexander Hamilton. What's he mean? Does he mean like following your favorite chef or decorator or influencer on Instagram? Is that what he means? What's he mean by follow? Who does he consider a follower? Jesus defined for the crowd in our text in verse 23 a very powerful statement. It's, it's the essence of the fine print. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. First of all, Jesus wants this. He wants people who want him, who want to follow, desire is always the point of entry in following Christ. I mean, don't we know that? Don't we say, where there's a will, there's a way? Mm. When I first entered into ministry, I was a youth pastor, and we had about 45, 50 active teens in our youth group. You had a lot of things going on. You have that many teens. You need a lot of chaperones. You need a lot of help. And I remember approaching one of the parents of a teen in the youth group. I figure you got ownership with this youth group. I approached the parent and said, hey, this is a day. I got a function. I need some chaperones. I don't ask the same people all the time. I just need some periodic help. And I approached the man and said, I need some help with young people like your son. His reply was, you know what, I'm just working too much and I got so many responsibilities, I'm not going to be able to help you. But the same man was able to make it to softball practice two nights a week. I would have preferred if he'd have just said no. I don't want to do that. Where there's a will, there's a way. And the same thing is true with Christianity. 
Same thing is true. There's got to be desire. There's got to be want to. No one is ever forced into Christianity. Jesus invites everybody. He inspires people to come in. I, I hope that every Christian you meet is an inspiring and inviting and welcoming person as Jesus has designed we should be. But no one is ever forced surrender in this world to Christ. Following Jesus can't be forced. He wants to be wanted. He wants to be chosen. Just a few weeks ago, a couple of months, or rather a few weeks ago it happened, Dale, who's here today, he came up around the front and shared his experience in following Christ. And just a couple of weeks ago he told the audience that was here, he said, I am still hungry and I am thirsty for more of Jesus. Desire. Desire. In fact, Dale's introduction to this congregation began online. He watched a number of services and he confesses, there's something there that I want. And so he came and so he prayed and so he experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is what happens when people want to. He's been involved with this congregation since that day. Desire. Want to. That's the, the core of it all. And here's the deal. I can't want it for you more than you want it for yourself. I can't want it for my spouse or for my kids or my grandkids. They have to want it for themselves. The only response, I can pray for them. I can desire for them. I can encourage and inspire. But at the end of the day, Jesus wants people who want him themselves. It's got to be want to. Observers, unfamiliar perhaps with the practices of Christianity, they, they may ask Jesus' followers, hey, why do you do fill in the blank? Just observing. Hey, why do you do fill in the blank? And certainly those who follow Christ need to be ready to answer some questions. The Apostle Peter wrote, if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. And so we gladly do so. But really, following Jesus is more than just knowledge. It's about attitude. It's about desire. It's about the want to. Why do you do what you do? Here, let me just share with you. Because I want to. Because I want, is it always easy? No, but I want to. Is it always clearly understandable? No, not always. I, I still read some passages of Scripture when I think, really? But I want to. I want to. It all starts there. Jesus said, if any wants to be a follower, it starts with desire. In addition to desire, Jesus said this, you must give up your own Way. You must give up your own way. In the next sentences, in verses 24 and 25, he gives some meaning, some context to give up. He says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost or destroyed? How, how's that for fine print? Jesus didn't hide what he was asking. In some translations, it says, deny yourself. Wow, Jesus, very clear, very direct, kind of in our face. And I'll just tell you, as someone who proclaims Jesus, it, it's my occupation to compel everybody I can, follow Jesus Christ. It, it's what makes me tick. Day in and day out, I pray over the city and my community. I try to meet people and show Christ's love and kindness. I, I try to get into conversations to welcome people to know the one that I know, to understand the joy and peace that Chelsea talked about earlier. It's my job. And I got to tell you, it would be easier if this denying yourself business wasn't in there. By the way, in the fine print, you got to give up your way of life. Ah, oh, that's a big deal. Typically, we don't like change, do we? 
And we don't like to give up to anybody. Americans, well, we seem to be indoctrinated to have it your way. Well, I guess I should give my fellow Americans a break. It's really in the heart of humans. Come on, how many toddlers of their own accord, they don't know that they're Americans, but they want their own way. They've got a will. They've got a desire. There's things they want to pursue. And so wise parents, they don't try to quelch that will entirely, but to mold it, to direct it, to help. Why? Because we want to help them succeed. You want that child to be able to manage their will so they can get along with their siblings, to allow some peace in the home, to get along in school and someday be a, a, an active participant and contributor to society. How do you do that? By managing your will. In similar fashion, Jesus calls followers to give up our lives for his sake. There's the fine print. Following Jesus means a life of surrender to him, of denying ourselves. Now, after detailing desire and surrender, Jesus then says this, take up your cross daily. Wait a minute. I thought the cross was his business. But here he makes it clear, take up your cross cross daily. At this point, he hasn't been crucified. Take up your cross daily. The cross isn't just for Christ. What is it about the cross? So the cross includes two important things. One, crucifixion. Two, resurrection. In the cross of Christ, we see those two things, crucifixion and resurrection, death and new life. When following Jesus Christ, the cross will continually be applied in our lives. Concerning followership, the Apostle Paul said this, I die daily. Obviously, that wasn't a physical death, but there were elements of his humanity, of his sinfulness, of his non-Christ-likeness that had to come to an end. And then Paul also said, anyone who belongs to become a new person, the old life is gone, a new life has begun. And that stepping into new things, that daily cross informs us. There's a lifetime of transformation. As we learn more and more about Christ and about his ways, there are elements of our lives that are moved to the back burner until they are gone. And there are new elements that are brought into our lives and become prominent and uh, priorities in our life. The farther we progress, the more we follow him, we learn more, we understand more, and we become more like Christ. So the cross, death and life, it's a daily reality. It's not a one-time event. It's not an annual review. It's a day after day we discover what will transform us into his perfect design. And let's face it, that daily transformation is a bit intimidating, isn't it? Because it's hard to hide. If I've spent my whole life, however the length it is, being one thing one way, going one direction, and then Jesus starts working on me. And my attitudes, my demeanor, my values, my things that I practice, I, I start becoming more like him. Folks around me are going to notice. You can't carry a cross without people figuring it out. There's no incognito Christianity. Can't work undercover. There's no secret service Christians. There's something that's going to be known. There's something that we haven't understand. Rather daily, we gladly associate ourselves with Jesus when we carry our cross and are transformed by his power. And finally, I bring you this. In verse 23 again, if any of you wants, there's desire to be my follower, you must give up. There's self-denial. Take up your cross daily. We just talked about that. And follow me. Follow me. Once again, the invitation. 
He starts with it, he concludes with it. Follow me. Confession, forgiveness, they're included in following. But Jesus has more in mind. Deliverance and victory, well, that's part of the process when we need to be changed and transformed. Many of us come to Christ because I need delivered from some aspect of something in my life. I need profound, miraculous change. And the Lord intervenes and does that in lives. And that's awesome, but Jesus has bigger things in mind. There's conversion, transformation, but these elements are just portions. They are segments. They are parts of the overall complete design. Ultimately, the fine print is this. Jesus said, come on, follow me. Follow me. Come with me. Jesus envisions more than Facebook followers. I just get periodic feeds about what's happening in Jesus' world and his activity. Jesus wants to be more than our favorite coffee stand. Or we stop by every week or perhaps every few days to get a caffeine fix and our favorite scone. Jesus invites us, follow me. Perhaps to get more definition of what that means, let's take a look or just consider... You can follow it in detail on your own. But how did those first followers follow? Those who were in the crowd that day, those who were initially part of his conversation, where the words of Scripture were not written on a page, they were coming from this man's mouth. They heard him for themselves. What did that look like? Check it out in Scripture. Those who followed him, those who accepted the invitation couple of things happened. Number one, they entered into new life. They walked away from their old life. Jesus became their life. Listen, so many things we do in our life in this day, we, we look at something and we say, you know what, I'm going to add that to who and what I am. It's like I've got my life's agenda and I'm going to pick up this and put it on as an addendum. And Jesus doesn't work that way. Jesus says, I'm top of the agenda, and I'll set the agenda. It's an all-encompassing thing. Check it out in Scripture. That's exactly what his followers became. Here's another thing that happened with followers. They called Jesus rabbi. That means teacher. It means experienced one. It means wise one. They went to him for insight and instruction. They went to him for guidance and direction. When they said, you know what, we want to follow you, Jesus, they didn't say, and I'll tell you what that means. No, they said, you tell us. Give me definition. Give me explanation. Why? Because you're the teacher. You're the wise one. We will trust what you have to say. And then perhaps even more challenging, Jesus was their Lord. Lord. We don't use that word today. Instead, we might think about how we would consider your honor in a court of law, recognizing the authority of a judge, of the law that she follows and enforces. Followers know Jesus as Lord because you're recognizing his divine authority. He's the final authority. Ultimately, what he says goes. When we're a follower of Christ... That's in the fine print. Some might say this, the buck stops with Jesus. Ultimately, it's not going to be about what I think and what I desire and what I, it's going to be about what he says. If I'm a follower, he is my Lord. That is the life of those who daily carry the cross. That's Jesus' meaning for following him. And I love this segment. I mentioned it in first reading, and I'm going to read verse 27 again. After Jesus discloses the fine print, after he reveals, this is what I really want from those who would follow me, then Jesus says this in verse 27, I tell you the truth. Some standing here right now, right now, will not die, before they see the kingdom of God. 
Some here right now, Jesus said, you see, you understand, you're going to get what I'm talking about. Some here right now will follow and accept the invitation that I am casting before you. In addition, Jesus recognized there are some in the sound of my voice you will follow. <laughs> in addition to pastoring this church, I've got a little side hustle. I got a lot of spare time. I work with a group of like-minded pastors and we try to recruit preachers to come to this area and start new churches. We try to bring in couples and families that will come meet people, tell them about Jesus and begin a new congregation. We call it church planting in modern vernacular. Now, I'm very con candid with those I'm recruiting. I try to get a sense of who they are and where they're from and what they're expecting. I'm real candid with them. Seattle is not the Midwest. It's not the South. Roberta, it's not the East. We are a culture unto ourselves. There are soaring natural beauties here. There are societal quirks. There are wide-ranging ethnicities and languages. There's incredible celebration of non-Christian ideals and other uniquenesses of our area. And so I'm very straightforward with potential church planners. I'll tell them about this place. I'll say it's not for everyone, but it might be for you. Within his teaching, Jesus confessed, not everyone's going to accept his invitation. He knew that. And so you and I, as proponents of Christ, we have to accept that reality as well. We don't like it. We wish it was different. We believe in this and believe everyone else should as well. But you've got to accept that not everyone will follow. So I say... To all that here today, not everyone accepts Jesus' invitation. But it might be for you. This isn't everyone's cup of tea, but you might be one of those as in the crowd of Christ that day. Some here right now will joyfully accept Jesus' invitation. Follow. Some here right now have been desiring something more, something with greater meaning, something with incredible purpose. And you can feel the love of Christ even in this place right now. Some here right now, even watching now or later, feel the pull of God's love. And like Dale's confessed so clearly, there's something there that I want. Maybe you can't define it. Maybe you can't explain it. Maybe you don't have all the things figured out. But yet there is something real and genuine compelling your mind and spirit. And you hear Jesus say, come on. Come on, follow me. Come on, follow me. Would you bow your heads with me? And as I mentioned earlier, in your own way, in your own fashion, would you just have a conversation with Jesus? Put a picture of Christ in your mind, whatever that would be like. See a face that is welcoming. See eyes that are filled with compassion. See a hand outstretched to you directly. Follow me. Lord, we're so grateful that you again have honored the glory of your word today. You let it be clear that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there. Lord, as many as have opened their minds and their spirits to your presence, we recognize indeed you are in this place even now. 
I pray, God, that your divine love and grace and mercy, compassion, O oh God, would minister, Lord, to every mind, every heart in this place today that is available to you. Men and women, young and old, some with tiny, tiny faith, some with urgent faith. God, whatever the measure of desire in this place, we welcome, Lord, your work into every life. Moms and dads, husbands, wives, young adults, single professionals, grandmas and grandpas, minister today. And I ask you, Lord, that beyond this time together, in every sincere life, in every hungry prayer that's being offered right now, I pray you would revisit, Lord, each of us. Perhaps later today, perhaps Monday morning or Wednesday afternoon. But soon, Lord, I invite a repeat visit of your love and compassion, God. For any old Lord who would right now be saying, well, it was just because I was in that environment. And well, it was a special weekend. You know, Lord, how our humanity works. You know, God, the things that sneak into our mind that would undermine faith. Lord, by your grace, I ask you to revisit our lives, Lord, in the hours and days to come. Verify your invitation and your call. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. To any and everyone in this house who has already made a choice and your desire is to follow after Christ, would you just right now maybe slip a hand in the air and thank the Lord for that invitation? Would you do that all over this place? If you're a person of faith, would you slip a hand in the air, raise your voice right now, just thank the Lord for that invitation. Thank Him that He invited you. Thank Him that He has welcomed you. Thank Him for His work in your life. That's beautiful. Come on. Every household, thank Him for the impact that He's making, uh, that He's continued to invest in your life. Lord, we worship You. We glorify you. We're thankful, God, that you are aware of us. We're thankful, Lord, that you see us, Lord, in our individual circumstance and that you have called us to yourself. What a treasure it is to know you, to be in a relationship with you, to call you a father and to be known as your son, your child. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Give me peace. You've been listening to the Living Faith Everett podcast series. Tune in next week for the next part of the series, or join us online at livingfaithministries.church.